Hi, welcome back to Youth Scogans, the International Law Podcast. Uh, we are finally back after 510 days uh, of a self-imposed hiatus. Uh, now I am back with two more members of the podcast, Faris Tathar and Shayan Ahmed. And today we are going to be talking about IHL clinics. And we'll be talking to Dr. Robert Heinz, uh, who is an Associate Professor of Public International Law at the Grotius Center for International Legal Studies at Leiden University. He's also the director of its LLM program on international law. He's also the director of the KGF Forum. I won't pronounce the actual name of the forum because I can't, uh, on international humanitarian law. And he also runs, he's the director of the IHL clinic at the KGF Forum. Uh, we'll be talking with reference to Dr. Heinz's article on the educational value of uh, international humanitarian law clinics, the examples of Leiden and Bochum. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Heinz, for taking out time and being on this podcast with us today. It's uh, an absolute pleasure to have you. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm uh, very excited to be here and, and to be able to talk to you about this, uh, for me, very important topic, uh, international humanitarian law clinics, because uh, it's something I really believe in and it's great that it has attracted some attention. Uh, so I'm very happy to, to talk to you about uh, this uh, new method of teaching international humanitarian law. Oh, uh, great to hear that. Uh, I I think Faris uh, has a question to start us off and then right. we'll take it from there. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, Dr. Heinz, it's, it's lovely to see you and it's great to have you on. I think I speak on behalf of the whole team when we say that, you know, we really appreciate you taking the time out uh, to be here with us. Um, and also just as a sidebar, I hope you and your family are safe and healthy in these incredibly uncertain times. Um, so yeah, I really, really appreciate you being here. Um, so yeah, so I, I think I'll start with a, a question about generally the, the normative foundations of clinical legal education. So could you perhaps talk a little bit more about the normative foundations of clinical legal education and also why, uh, um, or perhaps elaborate upon why it's taken a little bit longer for the advent of legal clinical education to come to Europe as opposed to other academic systems like the United States? Well, that's already a very profound question, I want to say, <laughs> and one which is maybe not so easy to answer. Um, also a question of a, a lawyer, definitely, because you're asking <laughs> for the normative basis of uh, clinical legal, uh, legal education. Well, let's put it like this, uh, maybe to, to start off with uh, a bit of background information on the history of uh, uh, law clinics. Uh, in, in many ways, uh, this is a system uh, which originates uh, in North America, especially the United States of America, where one can say that uh, already decades ago, um, uh, at the beginning of the last century, uh, there were law schools which started with um, uh, legal clinics, uh, meaning that uh, they used uh, the theoretical knowledge of the students uh, they acquired uh, during law school uh, in order to help um, the, the common people on the street. Yeah, so uh, in a way to give their students the possibility to advise people who could maybe not afford uh, an attorney or a law firm uh, in order to advise them for uh, normal uh, maybe simple legal question as is my my uh, house contract my my, uh, my lease valid uh, i had an accident with my car or mm. uh, i'm i'm seeking a, a residence permit uh, what do i have to do and uh, in a way the idea behind that was always twofold on the one hand uh, it gives students this uh, extreme uh, great opportunity to apply law uh, like hands-on to a practical case. Um, mm. So it's not just from a textbook, uh, but on the other hand, uh, to, to actually help people, to have societal impact, um, people who might not be able to, to be able to get legal advice. And, and so it's a win-win situation. Um, and I think nowadays, uh, currently, uh, every law school in the United States, uh, which uh, thinks uh, that it needs to attract good students has at least one legal clinic. Uh, usually they have quite a number, like a handful of legal clinics, five, six or seven with uh, different specializations. Mm -hmm. um, in that regard, uh, for a long time, there was no equivalent for that in, in continental Europe. Um, uh, the reason behind that, it's difficult to say. It might have something to do with the traditional uh, development of uh, legal education in Europe in a way that uh, in many countries uh, legal education is, is uh, 
built upon like a two-step approach to legal mm -hmm. education. You have the theoretical education at university and then a lot of countries like France, uh, the UK, Germany, Spain have uh, a certain period of practical legal training and that's when the, the law students then get the practical experience. Um, <clears throat> Because of that, and because of the fact that uh, European universities very often see themselves as so-called research universities, mm -hmm. which are also giving the possibility to do your PhD, um, it almost seems like that universities are or were afraid of, of mixing theory and practice uh, right. in a way that, uh, at least when I was studying law in Germany uh, 30 years ago, uh, I would not, ha not have had the chance to, to get a lot of practical experience apart from maybe doing like an internship on the site or something. Mm -hmm. But not, it was not part of the, of the legal education. And um, yeah, and, and at the same time, while I said the, the universities are maybe, were maybe hesitant to go into this area because they saw themselves as research universities, I think also the, 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 uh, the community of uh, fully educated lawyers, uh, uh, judges, uh, prosecutors and attorneys uh, were maybe hesitant to go down that road and, and, and push for this kind of education because in a way they might be afraid that students could take away some of their clients yeah, and say right. like, we are giving free advice, why should I go to, to a lawyer in the end? Uh, and on top, like the third component saying, yeah, what does it mean with regard to, to the, um, what should I say, like the risk of giving wrong legal advice, yeah? mm -hmm. who is carrying that? Because in the end, obviously, we have to uh, understand that students ha are not yet fully qualified. So they, it's obvious that they can't know everything. So uh, that might be different factors why Europe took a bit longer to pick up on this, this uh, uh, yeah, uh, kind of uh, legal education. And in that regard, for me, maybe I, I had the advantage on the one hand that I spent uh, a couple of years or uh, some time at least in uh, both the US and uh, United uh, Kingdom, mm -hmm. uh, being open to, to different approaches to, to legal education. And on top of that, in our area, in international law, uh, the, the, the borders or the, 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 the yeah, basis for education might be a bit different because in the end, to become an international lawyer, there is not something like passing an international bar exam or mm -hmm. something. It doesn't exist. Yeah. Right. Every, any student, and you uh, uh, know that maybe best, uh, who wants to become an international lawyer and practice, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm has usually only one option, do uh, their national training, national education, then maybe do an international LLM, and then fight their way through by right. doing internships, et cetera. Right. And I think that's where I picked up the ball in a, in, in a certain way eight years ago when we created the Leiden IHL clinic, um, because um, I had worked in practice before, I had many, many contacts, uh, especially, uh, in the, the NGO world, uh, the, the Red Cross, uh, Red Crescent societies, the International Committee of the Red Cross, human rights NGOs, etc. Um, so I had seen how international law works in practice and I, I worked as the then director of the master program and the director of the Karl Sofen Rieskes Forum on International Humanitarian Law. And uh, the, the idea of the Karl Sofen Rieskes Forum or the KGF, as we call it, was always um, to, to be based on three pillars, uh, education, uh, practical dissemination, and research. Mm -hmm. and in the end, I thought after one year, we created it in 2011, it would be great to combine those three, like right. have research, inspire uh, teaching, inspire practice, and the other way around. Uh, because right. then all three components uh, can learn from each other. And uh, at that time, uh, I had a couple of alumni who had just uh, graduated from, from, uh, from, from the program, from the Public International Law Program in Leiden. And I asked them what they were thinking of, uh, about this opportunity and whether they would be willing to help me with setting up such a clinic. And everyone, uh, and I know part of you, uh, uh, you had these colleagues, uh, everyone was extremely uh, energetic and motivated. Mm -hmm. And so that was the starting shot of, of um, uh, the Leiden IHL clinic. 
but it was at that point something which didn't really have a role model in Europe. So I was right. at the beginning, especially having, I had to persuade people that this makes sense. Right. All right. Uh, Dr. Heinz, it's interesting that you talk about the traditional uh, legal clinic model, uh, which has been around for some time. Uh, but in my understanding, uh, the traditional legal clinic model uh, mainly dealt with providing legal services and advice to individuals uh, and people who could probably could not afford uh, uh, quality uh, legal uh, opinions. Exactly, uh, how, yeah. how, how, how do you think that the IHL clinic model differs from the traditional uh, clinic model that developed in the US, as you said? Uh, because it seems, uh, even in the article that you mentioned, uh, that it's mostly research-based in which you work with partner organizations on a specific legal issue uh, or problem. So how, how, how do you understand the IHL clinic model? Yeah, well, uh, so I knew about um, the US American uh, role model. I, I also was in contact with colleagues who had set up uh, human rights uh, uh, law clinics in the US uh, um, or refugee law clinics, um, where even in those circumstances, the individual is uh, at the center of, of the clinic because it's about like maybe one individual needing to, to get advice on how they can uh, pursue their claim against the state, etc. cetera. Um, in that regard, international humanitarian law, in the same way as traditional general public international law, uh, is still not, let's put it like this, not 100% focused on the individual. It's still about mm -hmm. the obligations of states. Uh, um, and why this has changed in recent years uh, uh, with uh, the, the development of international criminal law, uh, where suddenly it's about individual criminal responsibility mm -hmm. and then what the individual has done. Um, nevertheless, uh, international humanitarian law originally was set up as uh, uh, by treaties uh, agreed upon by states. In that regard, and the main players are also states. So when I started the, the first year of the clinic, uh, I approached uh, three uh, organizations, um, the, the Netherlands Red Cross, um, the German Red Cross, uh, which is also uh, my former employer. I worked there as an uh, IHL legal advisor. And then the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights, uh, a small or medium-sized human rights NGO located in Berlin, uh, which does strategic litigation cases. Uh, and um, I knew that usually these players working in the human rights, humanitarian law sector um, don't have a lot of resources. It's not that they have like a big uh, corporate law firm, uh, 10 associate lawyers or 50 yeah. associate lawyers. Uh, they might, might have mm. one legal advisor specialized on IHL or maybe two. Mm. Uh, so I talked with them and in the first year, like all, the, uh, uh, all three of these gave me two projects each because they thought this is a great idea. We have either some abstract question uh, we want to get research, uh, for example, in order to, to, to uh, pursue some lobby work uh, in order to, to present our views better on the international sphere, or uh, to prepare a case um, in order to see, well, maybe uh, there's a reason uh, why in a recent conflict uh, situation, uh, IHL violations has been, have been committed. And um, we don't have so much infrastructure, but if you have a team of four or maybe uh, five or six students, they can do initial research, they can do the factual research, uh, and then they can analyze this toward, uh, against the, the IHL background. Um, so in that regard, uh, it took us quite a while until we had the first individuals coming to us uh, and asking for legal advice, mainly because in the area of international humanitarian law, uh, the, the actors are different. Yeah? It's uh, international organizations, it's uh, the Red Cross, uh, it's government agencies um, uh, or NGOs. Uh, it might be that nevertheless, uh, individuals are very much um, yeah, uh, affected by that. So mm. just one of the examples uh, last December, um, the European Center for Constitution and Human Rights uh, submitted a communication to the uh, ICC 
the International Criminal Court about uh, weapons deliveries to uh, Saudi Arabia uh, um, in the context of the Yemen conflict and possible IHL violations and war crimes. And, and we helped in, in many various ways um, on this way to submitting the, the communication uh, in uh, selecting arguments, selecting facts, uh, giving legal advice, uh, etc. Um, and they then use this uh, knowledge in order to find uh, actual victims uh, to get uh, more details. Uh, and in that regard, although it was an app, uh, it was an organization we worked for, it benefited in the end also the victims of, of these possible crimes. Oh, it's, so, great. Uh, it's great that you talk about the development of the model that uh, you did in Leiden and Bochum. Uh, before we move ahead, uh, would it be possible for you to briefly describe the program structure of the IHL clinic model that you have developed at Leiden and Bochum? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, I have to say uh, it's probably a, a bit of a different model in both, at both universities uh, because there are different programs. Um, uh, I, I might start with the, the Leiden model um, because that's in the end my home university and, and where I, I have no been doing the clinic for the last eight years. Uh, first, we started to offer the, the IHL clinic to the students of the regular LLM program and public international law once a year, um, namely in the winter term. By now we do it uh, twice a year, uh, in the winter and in the spring term. Um, the, the LLM students in public international law um, uh, I offered this in order to replace uh, one of their courses, uh, which are part of the public international law program. Um, so this is, uh, that used to be the practicum, which was some sort of a moot court. Last year we changed it to the privatissimum. It's a 10 ECTS course, which deals a lot with uh, legal research and, and applying it to, to yeah, international recent developments. So this fits well. Um, and uh, we take usually, I would say, uh, 12 to 18, sometimes 20 students per semester. Uh, it depends a bit, a bit on, uh, on the number of projects we have and also the, the number of uh, yeah, supervisors uh, we have at hand because uh, usually I put um, those uh, 12 students, for example, into groups of Four, uh, of te teams of four each. So then uh, if, we, if I have 12 students, I divide them into three teams. Uh, each team gets a supervisor and partly uh, even a second uh, senior supervisor in the background. Um, and then they work uh, for uh, this client. Uh, they are selected from uh, a pool of sometimes uh, 80 or 100, or we sometimes even had 120 applications. So it's quite competitive. They have to, it's, it's a bit like applying for a job. So I require the same documents. They have to submit their CV, uh, cover letter and their grades. And then we have interviews uh, because um, for us, it's important that the people can work together. Uh, so uh, it's important that they don't only are great legal minds uh, and have, to have a good motivation, which is important. Uh, but it's also important that um, they, they are able to have soft skills, yeah? that they can mm. work in a team, that they're able to, to deal with their supervisors properly and the clients. So it's a whole package. Uh, and that starts in September. Uh, the, the, uh, the selection process, first of October, is usually the kickoff uh, meeting where we uh, present the, 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 uh, the projects. Um, usually the clients give like a two or three pager with the main, uh, more, most important assignments. And then over a period of three to four months, uh, the students have a series of first lectures and thematical um, uh, sessions where they learn more about IHL or ICL or human rights law depending on the projects and then common seminar sessions in which we um, every two or three weeks discuss uh, the development of the projects. Um, on top of that they sometimes have weekly meetings with their uh, direct supervisors where they get advice on how how to, to approach this and then uh, at the end of the, the four months uh, they usually pr prepare a report or uh, case studies uh, or whatever was needed. Um, so this is the Leiden model uh, and it works similarly now also in the spring semester where I offer it 
uh, where I offer it to the advanced public international law course uh, here at Leiden. In Bochum, it's a bit different. So uh, two years ago, I got uh, the offer to uh, be the guest chair for international humanitarian law, international criminal law, and uh, applied legal theory uh, at uh, the Institute for the Law of Armed Conflict at Bochum University. And they have a master in humanitarian action. So it's about humanitarian assistance um, and, and all things related to conflict, disaster, uh, and how to help people in, in this context. Uh, it's an inter-European master. And the students there are not necessarily all lawyers. So it might be also that they're uh, doctors, medical doctors, engineers, um, uh, managers, etc. cetera. Um, and they need to do also law courses. And so there's a practical um, uh, section or a course on, on applying international law. Uh, but that's usually only six weeks. Uh, and I extended it, I think, to up to two months. So the, the, the period is much shorter than in Leiden. Um, and obviously the, the, uh, the, the background of the students is differently. Uh, but there are also usually 18 or 20 students. So I, I split them up into uh, groups of six. Uh, and then I found um, assignments which were maybe more related to humanitarian assistance, humanitarian action, uh, or certain areas which are dealing more with their expertise. Um, and and uh, I usually didn't hear in line by now, I have like a system of or a team of probably five to six supervisors who are constantly helping me with the clinic. Uh, in Bochum, the at the beginning, the infrastructure was a bit smaller. I had only one or two people helping me. So in that regard, then I gave the students themselves uh, more responsibility to coordinate themselves. But this always depends on the circumstances. In the end, uh, the results were usually the same. Uh, I have to say, uh, every year I'm always surprised how great students, uh, if you put them together in a team and uh, on a real case, uh, what uh, brilliant work they can produce uh, and uh, how motivated they are. Like, I mean, I'm teaching a lot of other courses um, where you just have to write exams and papers and I mean, in Leiden we are gifted in a way that there's always uh, a big crowd of motivated students. But with the clinic, you, you are always impressed, even as a professor, to see uh, what they can put together. Because sometimes after four months, I get a report where I say, I don't see a difference from what like one of my colleagues or myself uh, would produce. So these are a bit the two concepts. And we have exported this concept by now also to other universities. Um, uh, one of my colleagues uh, from Italy, uh, Giulio Battiglini, he spent uh, six months at Leiden University and uh, he also worked for the Red Cross uh, before. And then he went back to Rome uh, and set up also an IHL clinic uh, modeled and built after the Leiden uh, idea. Uh, a year later, I had a colleague uh, from Egypt, uh, Mr. Ahmed Khalifa, uh, Dr. Ahmed Khalifa. He came also six months to, to Leiden and helped me set up the clinic in Bochum. And now he went back to, to Egypt uh, and set up an IHL clinic uh, at the German University uh, in Cairo. Um, and uh, last June, I was with my PhD fellow, uh, Sophia, in Jordan, in uh, Amman. And we uh, explained to a group of seven colleagues from the Middle East uh, what we are doing in Leiden. And as a result, now uh, a new IHL clinic in, uh, um, uh, in Amman was created four months ago. Uh, I think they're now working on a new clinic also in, in Palestine and in Beirut. So it's spreading, this idea. Uh, great. Well, that was a very comprehensive overview of the models that you have used. I think that will help ground the discussion uh, better for the remaining uh, part of the podcast. Uh, I'll hand over to Shayan, uh, I think, he, who has a follow-up question. So, Dr. Heinz, from the standpoint of students, what legal skills do you hope to instill in them in, in order to make them better humanitarian lawyers for the future? And also, how through these clinics do you seek to bridge the gap between theory and practice in terms of international humanitarian law? Can you repeat the last half sentence? It's what, what? So, 
yeah. so how do you through these clinics how do you seek to bridge the gap between theory and practice in terms of international humanitarian law good maybe i answer that question first um so how do i imagine to bridge the gap between theory and practice is obviously always in international law a good question yeah because uh, there are probably a lot of people outside in the world who say is international law actually law is it not just uh, politics uh, power politics especially how can we enforce international law well i think the the last 20 25 years has shown uh, have shown that through the development of international courts and tribunals enforcement has become uh, much better it's not perfect and especially in the area of ihl uh, there are definitely things to improve but by uh, giving the opportunity um, every year every semester uh, to, to uh, 12 16 or 20 students um, at our faculty to learn about ihl to to help other organizations to to apply ihl in practice uh, what is happening is that we are creating uh, a whole movement, a whole group of uh, new international humanitarian lawyers who get excited about the fact that international humanitarian law can help the victims of war uh, to protect them better. Um, so my impression is and my experience after eight years of doing the IHL clinic in Leiden that uh, quite a number of our alumni from the clinic uh, afterwards uh, continue to go on to partly work for these organizations. By now we have uh, alumni who are working for the ICSC in Geneva and Brussels, uh, who work for the, their foreign ministry here in The Hague, for example, who work for organizations like the European Center for Constitutional on Human Rights and who have also moved to the ICC or the, the uh, Special Tribunal for Lebanon. So by now, actually, the, the clinic alumni are spreading all over the world uh, in a way. And we had even alumni, uh, one of my uh, uh, recent alumni, uh, alumni uh, from, from last year, uh, Alexandre Nicolet, uh, a French uh, uh, student. Uh, he went back to Paris and created his own uh, IGL clinic at uh, Paris uh, Panthéon Azaz. Uh, so, uh, in a way, it's like, um, apart from teaching those students uh, what IHL should be uh, applied to in, in practice, it's also uh, using them as or developing multiplicators, yeah? people who uh, spread the knowledge of IHL uh, and help to apply it better. Uh, so it's, uh, it started small. But by the fact that we are not the only IHL clinic nowadays, uh, back then when I started the clinic, there was only one other IHL clinic in the US uh, at Emory Law School, uh, which started actually three or four years before the Leiden one uh, by my colleague, uh, uh, Laurie Blank. Um, but by now, uh, we have also uh, initiatives uh, in South America, um, in, in Asia, in Africa, in North America, in Canada. Um, so uh, by, by setting up this kind of uh, new tool of IHL clinic education, uh, I think we are reaching a lot of young people who then go on to, to uh, advise their governments, advise their organizations, uh, and maybe go to the field um, uh, to, to help apply uh, IHL. So it's, it's a thing to, to not only teach people, but also to motivate people and maybe show them. And that's also the idea, of course, behind that. As a master student, you probably chose this idea to, to do a public international law master because you wanted to maybe uh, contribute a bit to a more peace in the world, to a better situation uh, in conflict situations. Uh, but maybe you didn't know how to do that because like, to be honest, these jobs are not around the corner. Maybe they're around the corner if you're living in The Hague like I do, because like the Peace Palace is 10 minutes from here. Uh, but for many other people, there are hardly any options to, to uh, work in this area. By joining the IHL clinic, 
they get uh, options. Yeah, they see ah, there is the Red Cross is doing that. Uh, the this NGO is doing that. The government uh, also uh, deals with the international humanitarian law. So uh, and then they get contacts. Uh, they they learn uh, about people uh, who. Uh, are giving them the assignments and say like how how did you manage to get this position how did you get into that post uh, and maybe uh, also uh, some of my clients then get interested in the students and say ah I know that name they worked at uh, Robert's IHL clinic in Leiden I take them as an intern so it's it's uh, there are various components which help I think to to transfer the the knowledge of IHL from theory to practice. Absolutely. I think, uh, Dr. Heinz, that was, that was a fantastic answer. And uh, speaking as a Leiden Clinic alumnus myself, I can guarantee that the kind of exposure and uh, interaction that you get at the clinic is, is the, the yields are immense. And, and having had to work with the Coalition for the ICC after the clinic and now working in the private sector in the Netherlands, I think it's phenomenal how useful and how um, frequently I get to use the skills I acquired in the clinic at Leiden. So we'll definitely can vouch for everything that you said. Um, in, in advance to that question, now I had a follow-up question because you talked about the, the importance of dissemination and having students, practitioners and the public at large, I think, wanting to be more aware about IHL or that's the, the objective. So my question is, how effective has the IHL clinic been as a platform for uh, disseminating IHL? And how has the clinic linked up with partner organizations to, such as the ICRC, to firm the aim of awareness in general, I think? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, that's always uh, a tricky answer, uh, mm -hmm. question to answer because uh, I'm a lawyer, I'm not a uh, social scientist which does empirical studies, although I actually uh, studied also partly social sciences, uh, sociology. Um, so what kind of impact we have, um, it's obviously my personal uh, evaluation uh, impression. Um, so there, there's probably maybe one project which is uh, the best way to, to illustrate what kind of um, uh, impact we can have. Uh, and you talked about our partner organizations. Uh, about five years ago, um, I got in contact with my uh, American colleague, Laurie Blank in, in, at Emory Law School and my Israeli colleague, uh, Yael Diaz Grossman at IDC Herzliya. Uh, and at that moment, we, we were first surprised that there are other people who have IHL clinics. So we met each other and then we thought, oh, this is great. Uh, um, can't we do something together? Uh, and the first thing we did is that we, I thought uh, maybe it's good to bring uh, the students, our IHL clinic students together uh, once a year for like mm -hmm. five days and have like IHL clinic exchange conferences. Um, and that was a bit of an ambitious endeavor because uh, we needed to fly people across the, the Atlantic, etc. Mm -hmm. But we were so, so lucky that we got uh, external funding for this. And uh, uh, five years ago, we had the first conference in, in Tel Aviv, uh, where the American, the Leiden and the Israeli students came together. And as of then, we also thought maybe it would be good to, to have a project together. And uh, uh, since I had long-standing uh, ties to the Red Cross and the ICSC in Geneva, I contacted one of my former colleagues there. And he thought, uh, Vincent Bernard from the ICSC, he thought, well, we would like, uh, he was the editor-in-chief of the International Review, and he said, we are currently thinking about how can we present IHL better and, and find proof that IHL is working in practice, that it's complied with. because. That was like during the Syria conflict that uh, uh, people were talking about IHL is not uh, complied with anymore. Mm -hmm. And then we came up with the idea to have a complete new approach and look for positive examples of uh, compliance with IHL. Um, in contrast to what we do here in The Hague, uh, right. prosecute the, the war criminals. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started with those three uh, 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 clinics and then uh, expanded it to the, the Italian clinic at Romatre and uh, last year also the Bochum clinic in Germany. Sorry. And we asked the students to find uh, real life examples from the battlefield uh, where IHL was complied with. Mm -hmm. And after uh, three years ago, or two and a half years ago, I think, September 2017, I want to say, 
um, we launched a, a database which is available now online, which is called IHL in Action, uh, mm -hmm. and you can Google it and find it there. And it provides like a world map of conflicts. I mean, that's sad enough because you see all the conflicts, right. but then you can click on these conflicts and then you can find examples where IHL was complied with, uh, meaning civilians were protected, uh, prisoners of war were treated uh, properly, uh, dead bodies were exchanged in order to give them to, to their families, um, uh, means and methods of conflict, uh, of con uh, means and methods of uh, hostilities were uh, complied with. So and this is now becoming very popular because right. uh, finally there is also something which shows IHL is actually applicable. So this mm -hmm. is one good example because it's also publicly available. Um, during the time we, we did a lot of work for NGOs uh, in different situations, helping them to, to do factual and legal analysis um, which uh, prepared then uh, court cases either in a national jurisdiction or an international jurisdiction. So we had cases which we supported both in national jurisdictions and which led to, to uh, yeah, uh, finding people uh, guilty of uh, committing a crime. Mm -hmm. And we helped people to, to support uh, communication to the ICC, um, things which are still pending. Uh, but right. which started a project, uh, uh, a process which was like uh, gigantic. One one has to say, like like 200, 250 pages of report, uh, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, we now this year had had uh, two um, amicus brie, uh, amicus courier briefs uh, to uh, the ICC and the Special Jurisdiction for Peace in Colombia. So the mm -hmm. uh, ICC amicus was on, on the situation in Palestine, uh, the special jurisdiction uh, for Colombia obviously had to deal with the, the civil war there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and on top of that, we helped uh, Red Cross national societies uh, to, to support their cause uh, when they are negotiating on an international level on, on like current issues like cyber warfare, mm -hmm. uh, lethal autonomous weapons, uh, etc. So, I, it's difficult to, to uh, put that in numbers. We also helped uh, one uh, Ministry of Defense with uh, drafting their, their military manual or, or bringing together like uh, all the views which were uh, available on certain problems uh, in, in international humanitarian law. So on different levels, uh, different uh, possibilities of impact. You see some examples on our website. Uh, unfortunately, uh, quite a number of the reports are confidential, so uh, okay. it's more something where I can tell you it was a recent conflict situation, but I can't tell you which one. Right. Well, thank you for I, that. I think we'll do the guessing. <laughs> uh, I, hope, uh, I hope uh, Faris was one of those uh, motivated students that you talk, talk about. Definitely, uh, yes. Yeah. Unfortunately, being a spring uh, student, I was unable to apply for the clinic. <laughs> I, I, will, I, I, I will always regret that fact. But uh, <laughs> nevertheless, uh, it's interesting that you talk about the confidentiality of the reports mm -hmm. uh, because uh, you talk about your connections and your references uh, while you were establishing uh, the IHL clinic uh, at Leiden and Bochum. But for an independent researcher or for somebody else, for example, currently I'm helping an international organization in Pakistan to uh, help est to establish IHL clinics in Pakistan. Uh, how would you approach these humanitarian actors and uh, organizations to engage with students on such sensitive and confidential data? Because if I look on the website of the KGF forum, only one report on uh, a responsible approach towards data uh, that is publicly available yeah. uh, from, from around 30 projects of, uh, <laughs> of the clinic so far. So given that, that, uh, that the information that you're dealing with is so sensitive and confidential, uh, it's, it's, it, it might be a difficult job to convince these uh, actors to actually allow undergraduate or even graduate students to work, to work on, on these it. projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, 
first of all, uh, since last week, uh, so like five days ago, we now have two additional reports online, the two Perfect. Amicus briefs, uh, which I just, which we just uploaded, uh, and uh, and obviously the IGL and Action Project uh, reports are all uh, available online. So out of those 35, 36 reports, uh, I would say one third by now is uh, publicly available. But good question. Uh, the confidentiality is key, um, and uh, yeah, uh, very important is that. Uh, every student before actually uh, learning about what kind of assignment they are getting have to uh, sign a special confidentiality agreement uh, where it becomes clear that they are not allowed to talk to anyone uh, about the project, uh, uh, give away any kind of information they're inquiring during this uh, uh, the time of the, the uh, writing of the, the report um, and we take this very seriously because um, obviously this uh, are sometimes very sensitive uh, issues on conflicts which are still ongoing um, uh, sometimes uh, it's it's referring to to individuals which might be harmed because of that uh, if something comes out um, and it is uh, yeah, of course it's a balance, balancing act, um, but with eight years of experience, I can say um, due to our very rigorous selection process, we only take students where we have the feeling, okay, they are not only uh, great legal minds and have uh, the, the necessary uh, theoretical qualifications, but they are also uh, good human beings and have uh, a decent character where we can trust that when they sign this confidentiality agreement uh, they keep this uh, confidential and um, in the last eight years I can't report of any moment I we had once a client who came back to me and said like yeah, uh, someone uh, who worked for us um, actually put this in their CV, which is obviously tempting. Yeah, you want to talk about or like at least indicate that you worked on such interesting thing in order to make you also interesting for possible employers. Uh, but then he said, but I have to say it was not a Leiden student. Uh, and I said, yeah, no, no, because like the Leiden students usually come to me and say, what can I write? Uh, what? The? And then I say, well, you can say, okay, it's a... A complicated legal issue for recent conflict yeah and uh, maybe one or two other uh, criteria which don't clarify who the, the client is but in general uh, the, the the main idea is we are helping in order to to help these organizations to help the imp uh, to help the victims uh, of uh, often these uh, crimes the IHL violations and we are not doing this in order to to uh, become famous yeah uh, and in that regard uh, it's sometimes hard for me because we are putting a lot of effort into this and then only have you have 30 reports there and there's like only one or two uh, pu public available uh, sometimes my colleagues ask what are you doing Robert yeah are you working at all and I'm like <laughs> I'm, I might be working more than a lot of normal academic colleagues, mm -hmm. but I can't publish it, which is very weird for an academic not to mm -hmm. publish it. Yeah, uh, but the idea is to help people, um, and and on the long term, uh, I think uh, this has show, uh, been shown successful because that's also the thing. Uh, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but nowadays, uh, as a student, of very often I, I was like an anonymous figure among like 500 law students, so I didn't feel like noticed uh, in my uh, legal education. Um, within, our, within our clinic, everyone counts, uh, and you, you're taken seriously, even if you're like the student researcher helping in the clinic. Uh, and that shows also by that you have to sign this confidentiality agreement and and by giving you this importance uh, I think it also makes clear that you you comply with this uh, in order to help uh, the, the the organization we are working to uh, for and that also makes maybe a difference I try to always bring the students in contact with our uh, client with our cooperation partner uh, because if you have that personal relationship you understand why you should not be talking to this even to your girlfriend or boyfriend or, mm -hmm. or a partner or something mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So, um, and, and that makes all the difference. Um, yeah. But in the end, uh, the, the short answer is everyone has to sign a confidentiality agreement when they write, uh, work on a confidential um, uh, project. And uh, until now, I have the feeling uh, this has worked quite well. Uh, Faris, before you ask your question, mm -hmm. uh, just before starting this podcast, uh, Faris was a little uh, concerned with uh, using Zoom because of its privacy concerns, yeah. because uh, apparently he has sensitive data from his clinic project yeah. two years ago, <laughs> and he still and he still hasn't. Yeah. Talked so which, all my all my which, reports, all which my organization project. you worked with, <laughs> I've tried yeah. asking him many times, but he still <laughs> refused to tell me. Uh, no, I think yeah, I was just about to add to what Dr. Hines said, and as a student's perspective, if somebody's already done this, the motivation, like Dr. Hines said, is not because oh, I worked for this this um, big organization, or I did this kind of work. If you, I think, I think the drive primarily is the motivation to, at, at a very young or early stage of a budding career, be able to contribute to actors and organizations who are actively making a difference. And I think that's that's really the drive and motivation and seeing how hard the clinic's working, how, how hard Dr. Hoynch is working in an anonymity with, with uh, a whole sort of diverse bunch of individuals and academics and students and researchers doing such a fantastic job. I think it, you, you owe it to yourself and to everyone around you and your colleagues to not disclose such information. Yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah. And I, as I said, usually I, I, I have a good sense for people <laughs> who don't get that. Uh, and that's, uh, I should maybe not say that publicly because now people will not do it anymore. <laughs> but sometimes there are people, uh, when I ask them in the interview, why are you doing that? And they literally say, yeah, because it's good for my CV. And I'm like, okay, there's the door. <laughs> yeah, because that's not what it is about. Yeah, yeah, not very so, subtle. yeah. Uh -huh. so uh, one of the questions which I had was, so in Bochum, you have this interdisciplinary master's program. And on yeah. the other hand, you have Leiden, which is specifically yeah. centered around law students. Yeah. So which can, and, everyone hear me yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. so so which uh, of these two clinics would you prefer in terms of the work ethic because i say this because there's a socio-political aspect to the work that is being done in the clinics so how beneficial is it to have students which are non-lawyers contribute to a sort of a predominant legal discussion or a legal research which is happening in the clinic yeah so um not an easy question. I, I, I want to also separate that maybe into two aspects. Uh, the one thing like the, the political aspects of uh, conflicts and how does that interfere with our work or how, how does that inform our work and then what is the difference between having only lawyers working on something? Uh, although I have to say in Leiden we also uh, partly admit uh, people who have mm -hmm. a political science background or international relations background and have done like additional legal qualifications afterwards. So they also <laughs> have a mixed background. Uh, but let's put it like this. First thing, uh, the, the political aspects of a conflict and, and the research we are doing, I mean, this is uh, probably the prime example of what you don't learn from a, a textbook of international law. Yeah, that, things are not black and white. It's not about like, it's a clear case of uh, uh, violation uh, of common article three of the Geneva Conventions, or it's not. Uh, um, the, the students, when they work on these cases, need to learn that as a lawyer, uh, you of course need to learn the law, but you also need to learn how to evaluate factual circumstances uh, and to, to understand and that's usually when we work on a conflict situation, the first two weeks, uh, students are always asked to just understand the background of the conflict. Yeah? And that doesn't uh, mean that they uh, know by uh, already look into the, the legal implications, but rather what has happened, uh, what are, who are the, the parties, what has contributed to the conflict. Uh, and then uh, they need to use that language and transfer it or these results and transfer it to the legal background. And this is something I think and any good lawyer needs to learn at one point uh, to, to make that connection between the facts on the ground and these might be politically influenced, uh, yes or no, uh, and the, the theoretical framework which I want to apply to uh, these facts. Uh, and I think that's the beauty uh, of, of the clinic. Uh, it offers 
uh, you this opportunity already during your studies. You don't have to work uh, a couple of years until you, you come to, to work on one of these cases yourself, but you can already do that during your studies and understand uh, that it might be, uh, it might sound easy to decide whether this is an international or non-international armed conflict in theory. I mean, it, even in theory, it doesn't sound easy, but in practice, it might be so much more complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and so this is a skill then they learn. Does it help to have uh, an interdisciplinary crowd uh, or interdisciplinary students working on this? Uh, it depends a bit on what kind of uh, case or assignment you're working on. Yeah, so uh, I think I have experienced that um, uh, assignments which have uh, a more global approach uh, uh, in a way that uh, also like uh, uh, a situational analysis uh, is important uh, or certain new ideas have to uh, come up um, then it helps if you have this interdisciplinary background so then it's maybe helpful to have a medical doctor or an engineer explaining you how certain things work uh, and and completely thinking outside of the box uh, in, in many ways um, and and some of the the, the uh, examples we did for the IHL in Action project. Uh, this was really helpful also because in, in, in Bochum, comparable to Leiden, but in Bochum specifically, a lot of the students also come, com come from conflict situations. So they have first-hand experience uh, and then they bring this experience to, to the table. Uh, so that's great. At the same time, if we want to write uh, communication or prepare to help uh, to write uh, communication to the ICC, it's about jurisdictional questions, the question of admissibility or the elements of crimes. And in the end, that's the reason why we, we are educated as lawyers. That's not easy to uh, answer. And that's also something, uh, even if I do my best to give introductory lectures on IHL and ICL, uh, it's usually not something you learn within like three or four weeks. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So uh, if I have like a very legal and especially procedural uh, assignment, uh, then it might be very helpful to have a team of full-fledged uh, law students uh, mm -hmm. available. Yeah? But uh, it's, it's a question of, of choosing the right project. Uh, both can be very inspiring. Um, up to a point that I now also uh, took one of my former uh, Bochum students and hired him as a guest researcher uh, here in Leiden and he spent just like uh, four months at, at the KGF. Uh, so there's also now an overlap between uh, those two, two master programs. So I think, I hope I answered both questions. Yes, I did. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this uh, leads me to a very contemporary question that we have. So the model from, from my understanding seems to be one which requires a lot of in-person contact with the groups meeting, the teams meeting with the supervisors. So with the issue of the coronavirus, so how, how do you see it differing now in terms of the structure that you uh, already explained in terms of the clinic? Yeah, <laughs> you're, you're uh, touching upon uh, an, a very obviously interesting issue and yeah. something I had to deal with uh, during the last six or seven weeks. Um, yeah, uh, as you say, um, the clinic, as I set it up, both in Leiden and in, in Bochum, was always based on, on uh, close uh, social interaction. Yeah, so... Uh, uh, as I said, in Leiden, we have always two supervisors for a team of four students. Um, uh, we have seminar sessions, we have lectures, we have individual uh, coaching and supervision uh, meetings. And that was all in person. That was in class or that was, uh, yeah. yeah. And now uh, what we had to do, we have currently, I have currently uh, 20 IHL clinic students, uh, mainly from the advanced uh, master in public international law. Uh, I had to transfer the whole infrastructure, the whole uh, setup, both of the seminar sessions as well as of the, the supervision structure uh, to an online platform. Yeah, uh, in a way that, uh, but that's something we had to do now at the university yeah. in general. So we got also support for that. Uh, but let's put it like this, uh, Zoom is my best friend by now. Uh, so you understand why I have a paid subscription here. Um, because, um, yeah, so I, I want to say uh, 
I learned already during that time when I was uh, teaching both in, uh, at Leiden. I was still the director of the Leiden IHL clinic, but I built up the Bochum IHL clinic. And there were moments when I, like, I, I remember one day where we started both clinics at the same time on a Monday. It might have been stupid scheduling from my side, but it happened like this. Yeah. And so I opened the Bochum Clinic via Skype uh, here from The Hague uh, in the morning. And then uh, two hours later, I went to the campus here in The Hague and opened it in person. And in the evening, took the train to Bochum to then take over uh, doing everything in person in, uh, in Bochum. So um, in some ways now, uh, I want to say uh, we have the advantage of living in a time where we can actually talk to each other and not be in yeah. the same place. Yeah. So uh, the four of us would not have this conversation uh, 20 years ago, probably not even 10 years ago. Yeah? Yeah, but at the moment, it's actually okay. Uh, I mean, I even learn more about you than I usually would. Uh, if we would meet at the campus, I would not get an insight into your private <laughs> apartment or your office or whatever. Yeah. And vice versa. Yeah. You would not realize that I have like a black and white blanket lying here or, or things like that. <laughs> it's yeah. looking really nice. Yeah. I, I cleaned up. Yeah. So that's, that's it looks great. It looks great. Uh, yeah. No, but uh, obviously uh, there are some challenges uh, and uh, I'm missing a, a bit the personal contact because uh, as far as hopefully knows, I like working with students. I, I mm. like teaching. Uh, uh, but I also like doing that because I get immediate uh, feedback yeah? mm -hmm. and I, I, I do my best in order to, to accommodate everyone as much as possible and that's difficult. Uh, so we used at the beginning one software uh, where actually we realized I had 20 students in the room or in the virtual room but the software was not stable enough uh, and then we uh, 18 people switched off their video and then I was only talking and the person who was presenting their results was uh, having the video on <laughs> and that I made one time but that that's not for me yeah, yeah so we found a different software which is better uh, and where actually everyone can be on the screen um, and um, yeah, it has some advantages, I want to say. Uh, we, we should not neglect that. Uh, there are now some people who actually went home to their home country. So we, I have a clinic student now, and uh, a clinic student now who is currently in Brazil. The other one is in Australia. The only problem we have is when we meet all together, we need to find a time which is valid in all three time zones. Yeah, so like uh, spending yeah, pretty yeah. much uh, 22 hours of, of time zone in, in the world. Uh, wow. So which usually leaves only the, uh, the, the hours around lunch uh, or shortly after lunch. Uh, so in Brazil, uh, the colleague has to wake up early uh, and in, in Australia, the colleague uh, is uh, almost going to bed uh, afterwards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's possible. Uh, it's the same way as everyone is dealing with now. Uh, like I have here uh, weekly staff meetings with my team where I get updates on how the, the, the projects are going from my supervisors uh, or from our, the, our, my supervision team. Uh, and then we, we have our classes with the students online. Uh, and otherwise, I mean, uh, even before, a lot of the supervision is, of course, also sending drafts to the supervisors who then proofread the drafts and uh, send back the, 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 the comments. Yeah. So in the end, we look, live in a modern world uh, and in the same way with the clients. Yeah. So now we have Skype talks with clients. We had that already before because our clients come from all over the world. Um, and then we have Skype talks or, or Zoom talks. Um, uh, and we now do that like, yeah, 100% the clinic is now uh, virtually online. Uh, I hope at one point I can see the people again in person, but at the moment we are coping with that Hopefully, as, yeah. as, as uh, well as possible. Yeah. I hope you're being generous with the deadlines for the students, uh, <laughs> because that's very important. <laughs> and uh, uh, mad respect to you for working hard during these challenging yeah, times. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I'm sure your students yeah. are missing yeah. your jokes and you're facing <laughs> around from one corner of the room to the other corner. Uh, yeah, you know me. Yeah, yeah. That, that's so, and you're 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 bringing actually the the emphasis on 
uh, the one thing I'm missing most. It's like this running around from one <laughs> corner of from one corner of the room to the another, uh, which is difficult because uh, you can't do that with like mm. your headset. So, uh, I mean, yeah. I, I without could have running like, into something. Uh, yep. Also, I'd like to apologize to all of you and the audience as well for changing positions and darkening up. I had a little technical difficulty. I had to charge my laptop. So okay. <laughs> I apologize for yeah, that. Yeah, we being in Pakistan don't have any technical difficulties, but you being in Rotterdam. <laughs> uh, <you> well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, thank you uh, so much, Dr. Heinz. Before we let you go, there's one last question. Mm -hmm. uh, you, we have already taken a lot more time of yours than we no said. Problem. Uh, but I hope uh, you found some meaning in this. <laughs> uh, so I just want to talk uh, a little bit about the global IHL clinic network, which I'm also yeah. a part of. Uh, yeah. As you said that currently you have this association of five or six uh, universities uh, around the globe, uh, which also do the uh, annual exchange conferences uh, for the IHL clinics. So how do you see the role of the global IHL clinic forum uh, in terms of uh, increasing the number of clinics and in dissemination of IHL in general? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, if I would know the complete answer, first of all, if I want to give the complete answer, it would take probably another hour. Uh, so we I don't mind. Just, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I try to keep myself short also because it's something which I have to say, um, I have a vision where this is going, but uh, I also learned over the last couple of years that some things just develop uh, by itself uh, and, and, and that regard. Um, so uh, at the moment, today was actually a good day to have this uh, uh, conference call because uh, we just submitted um, a funding application for uh, four more years uh, of uh, exchange conferences today with my uh, partner uh, uh, university. Congratulations. congratulations. Thanks. Well, yeah. like if we get the money, then you can give me congratulations. <laughs> um, <clears throat> at the moment, um, things have changed because at the beginning, uh, literally there were three partners, uh, Emory mm -hmm. Law School in Atlanta, IDC has here in Israel and Leiden University. It has now grown um, and thanks to the fact that I think Leiden has a very good position in the world as A, a law school, but B, also close to the Hague, to the institutions uh, and C, the fact that I like to travel around and, and uh, help other people uh, set up clinics. Um, we have now these different areas, uh, like especially uh, quite a number of uh, colleagues in the Middle East who are setting up uh, IHL clinics, uh, also inspired by the Swedish uh, human rights organization Diakonia. Uh, we have contacts in Africa, uh, in South America, in Asia, uh, also thanks to uh, this Bochum student who just uh, uh, established contacts uh, to, to colleagues in Asia. And um, our idea uh, is in the end, or my vision would be to have in five or in 10 years, um, uh, IHL clinics uh, on every continent uh, and have maybe at least one uh, IHL clinic in every country of the world, uh, like uh, National Red Cross or Red Crescent societies, uh, as a, a, a hub, as a center for, for disseminating and, and giving practical legal advice on international humanitarian law. This is extremely ambitious uh, in a way that I'm saying at the moment, I would not know how to, to, to coordinate all this. Uh, we have another funding application in the pocket where we uh, think about uh, setting up uh, Leiden as like a global hub for this IHL movement, IHL clinic movement, um, helping, and, and this was also part of the, 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 the submission we did today, uh, the funding. Uh, uh, the idea is that the existing uh, clinics want to develop uh, best practices on how uh, a, a clinic can be set up, how it can be conducted, how you can uh, acquire uh, clients and cooperation partners, uh, how you supervise uh, projects, etc. Uh, and then share that uh, free of charge uh, to anyone who uh, is interested in that. Uh, and at the same time, give support uh, for uh, the existing 
uh, clinics. Uh, so that might be small support, like the colleague in Jordan uh, asked me whether at the opening of his clinic I could get, uh, speak some words, uh, which I did via Skype at that time. I didn't fly back to uh, Jordan a second time, but I did this via Skype. I did the same thing in, at Roma Tre, but then flying there. Uh, I had now colleagues, again, uh, party alumni from, from Leiden who set up uh, an IHL, ICL clinic at Edinburgh University. Um, I had them uh, by getting in contact with my alumni from the clinic and my past supervisors to help them as external supervisors. Um, and uh, whoever approaches me or who now we have set up this website where, where you can register on this uh, global IHL clinic network uh, and whoever approaches me uh, we try to to provide expertise to but at the moment we are doing this with a small team of, of uh, uh, yeah uh, PhD students student assistants uh, and colleagues uh, from the Grocer Center and the KGF um, at the moment the, the, these colleagues are mainly here to help me with the supervision of the clinic. If we want to coordinate this global IHL clinic network, uh, it would on the long run uh, be necessary to, to hire new people. Yeah? And also uh, to, to have uh, a coordinator, like a, an executive director, uh, who, uh, whose expertise might not be law, but maybe communication and networking, uh, etc. Uh, at the moment, we, we take it day by day and month by month and take the opportunity of that, like one of my former colleagues at the ICC now is the, the IHL legal advisor for Diakonia in Beirut. And she helped me supervising one of the, the projects here and uh, is now spreading the word in the Middle East uh, in a way that it's almost like yeah, uh, amazing that in seven, eight uh, countries, people are interested in setting up IHI clinics. Sometimes it's also just word of mouth. Yeah, people hear about this uh, and say, oh, okay, in Leiden, it seems to be very busy with regard to IHL clinic uh, activities. Uh, maybe they can help us. And uh, for me, it, it's maybe it's due to my Red Cross background. I, for the last 25 years, I worked as a volunteer for the, uh, the Red Cross. Uh, where I think like IHL dissemination is, is a key uh, principle uh, and for me it's like I, I want to give this quality education to our Leiden students because I used to be the director of the LLM program here and the, there's a certain, certain connection mm -hmm. but it's also a brilliant idea to say why not offer this worldwide yeah and by offering it worldwide actually having an impact we can't even dream of yeah because it's a bit like uh, if, if I can, uh, if I take 20 students per semester, I can have here in Leiden, I have 40 students per year. That's a nice number. But if we think about the fact that we have 10 IHL clinics uh, and multiply that by 10, we have 400 students per year. If we have, I don't know, uh, 20, uh, 30, 40, 50 uh, clinics uh, in the world, this is uh, getting an impact uh, where we can say maybe that can have, a, have an effect on how uh, IHL is applied in practice, how victims are protected in armed conflict. Uh, so in general, uh, the, the sky is the limit, uh, but uh, even in this very idealistic area of international humanitarian law, uh, without money, uh, uh, you can't uh, move too far. Uh, so until now, a lot of people also helped me on a on a pro bono basis. Like if you look on our website, you have more than 50 uh, young colleagues who over the last eight years uh, dedicated part of their time for free to the supervision of these projects. Uh, I would have not been able to, to create all this without these very motivated young uh, colleagues. Uh, but now we are reaching a point where yeah, we need also infrastructure. We are working on that. As I said, we just submitted a funding application. Hopefully in the future, this is going to get further because I think uh, it's one of these rare moments where you have a win-win situation. Yeah? The, the students learn something for their life, for their, their practical training. They, they benefit for their career. 
the organizations learn uh, or get get uh, inputs, uh, valuable reports that they can use for their work. Victims uh, benefit from this. And as a teacher, as a professor, uh, I, I benefit in a way that I, I have the feeling I can inspire young people and, and uh, at the same time have a practical impact. So uh, there are still a lot of uh, things to do. Uh, in that regard, I'm also happy always to talk about this. So yep. thanks for me. Uh, thank you guys for giving me that opportunity today because uh, if people hear this, maybe they get interested. And, uh, and that's also the beautiful thing um, I learned. I had this idea eight years ago to set this up, but by now I have so many people helping me who come up with ideas I would never have, uh, or not on my own. Uh, and so it's, it's, a, it's a creative mass of, of motivated people. Uh, and that's obviously uh, beautiful because uh, you, you feel a bit like a pioneer. Uh, and sometimes when I have moments when I think it's getting too hard or uh, I'm exhausted, uh, I don't want to continue with that. Uh, uh, then I have colleagues, uh, staff members, team members who say, no, I have this idea, let's do this. Or Robert, we don't need you. We do it on our own. And, and that's the great thing. Uh, brilliant. Uh, on that positive note, during these gloomy times, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Heinz, for taking out time. It was an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast. Uh, I hope you feel the same way about us. Uh, if you <laughs> have any parting uh, thoughts about uh, IHL clinics or the podcast or anything else, you, uh, you can. the floor is yours. Yeah, maybe just uh, emphasizing what, what I ended up with uh, in my, my last statement. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe being a bit more direct, uh, so everyone who is hearing this uh, and feels uh, somehow motivated uh, to work in international law and not yet knowing what they want to do, um, there are so many ways to do this uh, and to help. You can come to Leiden, become a student, become a member of the clinic. You can also send me an email about uh, helping me in the supervision of the project or uh, if you want to do something in your home country or at your home university uh, you, you can set up uh, a new project and it doesn't have to be always like the Leiden model or the Bochum model or whatever mm -hmm. model uh, I think that the, 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 the positive aspect of my experience is that you can have something, uh, a, a new idea, and with a bit of persistence and working together with like-minded people, you can achieve a lot. And I think maybe that's as the final uh, statement, uh, I think the current times with the corona crisis uh, uh, has also shown us uh, the only way we are going to solve these global problems, be it armed conflicts, uh, natural disasters, or uh, pandemics, the, the only solution can lie on like working together and uh, in, in some way I uh, even though we are sitting at home nowadays I, I get the impression people uh, a lot of people understand that and realize okay we have to connect to our community yeah. I have to help my neighbor um, and I have, have to help my, my, my grandparents or whoever needs my help and I think that's maybe a message we can uh, give to everyone uh, today uh, that like uh, think about how you can help others and be it on uh, the international law level or be it in your neighborhood uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't make a difference so uh, perfect uh, that's all from us uh, we'll see you after two years <laughs> <laughs> yeah doctor I just as a, as a parting uh, I just want to say it was, it was fantastic having you and, and brilliant brilliant to see that you could take out the time and and uh, you know really really just talk about something that you're so passionate about and when we really hope, first of all, we really hope that this gains traction and then people are genuinely interested in and look at the kinds of incredible work that the clinic is doing and hopefully contribute to that as well. So yeah, thank you so much for being here. Great, thank you for having me. Yeah. It was a pleasure, thanks a lot. Uh, do, do you have a parting comment? Yeah, I think uh, so as someone uh, from all of you combined, as someone who's only studied in Pakistan, the prospects of uh, uh, hearing about these law clinics and these new ideas so it really excites someone for, from a national jurisdictional point
to have these things to look forward to and to sort of learn them and then go back to your jurisdictions and apply them and sort of mm-hmm. proliferate the message. So yeah, that's it from my side. Yeah. And also just as a last comment, I just want to give kudos at least from my side to Omer for, for organizing this and for, for trying so hard to, to you know, take the initiative and uh, Omer, great job. Thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. All right. Thank you. The pleasure is all mine. Uh, and yes, uh, that's, that's it.